Now, the secondary transit stuff is all very difficult. I mean, you're looking at uh, even the original transits are too small to see from the ground. And in this case, you're trying to find secondary transits on slight slopes, which are very, very tough. Yeah, well, it strikes me, Paul, that uh, maybe we're looking in the wrong place in the spectrum because, you know, in optical light, the planets like Jupiter are just reflecting the sun, so they're going to be very, very faint. But if you have a Jupiter in close, it's going to be hot and glowing on its own. Now, it might be in the infrared, but if we look in the infrared, it strikes me we're going to maybe have some uh, bigger signals to, to get our, our hands on. Yep, so here's the spectrum um, in wavelength um, going from... Um, something with a temperature of maybe 6,000 degrees, like a sun-like star. And in this case, it peaks at visible wavelengths. But if you look at something that's uh, maybe at 1,000 Kelvin, like uh, one of these hot planets, they also will glow, but the glow might be out at you know, 3 microns, 5 microns, which is what we'd call infrared light. So if we look at visible light, like Kepler does, or the Hubble Space Telescope do, we're looking in the worst place, where the light from the star completely dwarfs over the planet. But if we go out... The actual green curve here is grossly exaggerated. It won't actually be as high as the red curve. Yep. But nonetheless, the ratio is going to get much better in our favor. The effect is going to be much bigger. Right. Well, that sounds good. The problem is observing in the infrared is hard. On the ground, the whole atmosphere glows. And if there's anything I hate doing, is going to the telescope and observing in the infrared because it's just so hard. Yes, you're struggling with the, the glow, because of course your telescope is glowing at these wavelengths. Yeah, the the atmosphere is, is glowing. glowing, and also the atmosphere is largely opaque because of the greenhouse effect on Earth. You've got lots of yep. particularly water vapour absorption that blocks you in a very unpredictable way and constantly changing. So trying to do this from the ground, even though it's a bigger effect, is going to be hopeless. So what we need is an infrared space telescope. Exactly. So... Fortunately, NASA has provided us with uh, the Spitzer Telescope. This is one of the great observatories and was done in the series that brought us the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, but also the Chandra X-ray Telescope. So Spitzer is a space-based infrared telescope. And even though it uh, had its mission, it needed to operate very cool to do its most uh, precise measurements. Yes, yeah, so its primary mission it had a huge, basically, tank of uh, um, coolant that yep. kept the, uh, the detectors in the mirror very, very cold. That eventually, after many years, boiled off. But nonetheless, at wavelengths of you know, a few microns, it can still work very nicely. Yeah, out at you know, 20 microns and so on, it can't work anymore since the coolant boiled off. But uh, those sort of few microns are good for looking at things of a temperature of maybe 1,000 degrees, which is exactly what we're looking for for these transiting planets. So a great resource for us to go out and look at these things. It's not going to find them in the first place, but if you found them by some other method, whether it be Kepler or a ground-based survey, this is a great telescope for following them up. And because it's in space, it has a sensitivity, and also because nothing is changing for it, it doesn't have to worry about day and night and varying amounts of water vapour and everything else. It can look for very small changes. Okay, so what have we seen? Well, the question we're dealing with here is what might the weather be like on hot Jupiters? If we look at the weather at Earth, it's driven uh, by the fact that more sunlight falls near the equator than near the poles. And so it's very hot here. And that causes wind from the uh, equatorial, equatorial regions to rise and then move out and fall down. And because it's spinning, that produces sideways motion, the trade wind. You can see all these storms around the centre, which is the air rising up. And so and then it moves further out and distributes heat away. If it was just in equilibrium, if heat couldn't move from the equator to the poles, the temperature difference at the moment well, might be typically maybe 30 degrees near the equator and minus 20 or 30 near the poles, so it may be a 60 degree difference. If it uh, wasn't for the atmosphere, it'd be more like a 200 degree difference. Oh, okay, so very substantial. Yes. Um, so what's happening is a large amount of heat is being carried by atmospheric currents and ocean currents as well on the Earth from the hot regions to the cold regions, so the temperature gap is nothing like as big as it would be if we didn't have an atmosphere. All right, so all we have to do is look at one of these Jupiters and see how it behaves, and we can, you think, get a sense of its weather. Yes. Now, Jupiters would have very different weather uh, because they almost certainly are tidally locked. As we talked about before, they would tend to face the same side towards the star. So we've got a star over here, and we've got the hot Jupiter, and this side is always going to face it. So as it goes around the star, it's always going to look at ah. the star. So we're going to have a hot side and a cold side then. Yes, so the orange and the blue side as I've drawn it here. And the question is going to be, 
Is there any weather to carry the heat from the hot side around to the cold side? If there's not many winds going from one side to the other, maybe the air, the, presumably there are gassy things, maybe yep. the gas on this side is just sitting there incredibly hot, and the gas on that side maybe is sitting there incredibly cold, and nothing's transferring. Or maybe, like on Earth, you've got winds, but with probably a rather different pattern because it's spinning only every few days as it goes around the star, but that might still be enough to drive some quite interesting weather patterns. Okay, okay. So... so the answer is, well, at the time of producing this video, uh, there are about three systems which have these data. Uh, this will go up dramatically probably even by the time this course goes live, so it's probably out of date even today. Um, one of them is New Andromeda, which is, uh, we've already talked about the, one with the first one where they discovered three things that are hot Jupiter and two eccentric giants further out. In this case, there's a huge day-night temperature difference. So, uh, it's that, so that's sort of telling us that it's really, there's not a lot of wind there to redistribute things. Or maybe the wind's just, you know, doing loop loops around the hot area, but not carrying too much heat around the cold. Yeah, okay. And um, one or two others uh, finding similar sorts of results, where there seems to be a huge gap in temperature between day and night. All right, so these may be kind of boring places. But is that always the same? Do we get the same answer wherever we look? Well, here's another one, which is a different answer. Um, here we've got the overall light curve of the main transit and the secondary transit. And again, you've seen the little slope up here. And you can see how much bigger that transit here is compared to that one. Remember, in the previous ones, you couldn't even have these on the same scale. But in the infrared, you can suddenly see them. That's the yes. power of the method. And if we zoom in, you can see this clear change here. And what you're seeing is the difference in brightness there and there is telling you the difference in heat between the day and night side of the planet. And the dip here is when you lose the entire planet. Yep. So the gap there is telling you how much radiation you're getting from the day side, and the gap from the bottom there to here is telling you how much radiation you're getting from the dark side. So you see, even the dark side of this one is glowing quite a lot. Yes. You know, it's, it's hotter in the day than the night, but not very much. Okay. So in this case, we're talking maybe a 200 degree difference. So maybe you know, 1,200 degrees in the day side and 1,000 uh, of the night side. So in this case, there does seem to be some sort of wind, because 200 degrees would need a wind to carry it around. So somehow the heat is getting moved from the day side to the night side in this particular case. Okay, so not everything is the same. We seem to, again, have a very large range of phenomena. And this, uh, the pattern is maybe slowly becoming clear here. It kind of looks like if, when you find the planets that are really close in the very classical hot Jupiters, in those cases there seem to be the very big um, day to night temperature differences. But when you get the ones that are a little bit further out, some of them still have the very big temperature differences, but some of them have much smaller ones. So it looks like maybe there's something about being very close and that actually s stops winds. Maybe it's just such a big difference and maybe the tidal force of the star, I don't know what, what could be doing it, seems to shut down this heat transfer. But the ones a little further out can do more like the Earth do and have currents that carry the, the uh, heat from day to night. But it's still early days. We only have a handful of these, so we'll learn more as we get more data.